If you remember, Paul just explained the end of chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2, the difference between a natural man and a spiritual man. A natural man, remember, is someone who cannot receive spiritual wisdom from God. He cannot know the things that are freely given to him by God, nor can he know the mind of God. All of those things, Paul says, are available to us. But the reason why is because he does not have the Spirit of God dwelling in him. The natural man is unregenerate. He is still dead in his trespasses and sins. And so from God's perspective, he cannot judge spiritual things properly because he does not have, again, the Spirit of God dwelling in him. Now, the spiritual man can judge spiritual things properly. He can receive spiritual wisdom from God because his spirit has been born again of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has come upon him, and the Holy Spirit now dwells in him. So the problem that the Corinthian believers were having is although that they were filled with the Holy Spirit, listen now, they were acting like the natural man or the natural person. They were spirit-filled people acting like natural people, which then introduces a whole new category that Paul brings up to us, and it's a category of being carnal. So the title of the message today is The Problem of Carnality. Now, carnal Christians, again, are spirit-filled people who are acting like unbelievers. Now, there are those who say that there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. And listen, I, I agree with their heart. I agree with that sentiment. I wish it were not so, but the evidence in people's lives is overwhelming that such a thing is possible, as well as the Spirit of God speaks to it through the Apostle here in this section of the letter to the Corinthian church. So what does it mean to be carnal? We're going to look at that today. This is where the Spirit um, answers for us, so that we know how to think about it when we see it either in our lives or when we see it in in other believers' lives around us, so that we may see, listen now, the problems that it causes. And so that we would do everything that we can to not walk in carnality. So one of the problems of carnality that the Spirit points out, the first thing that we see here, is that he likens it to infancy. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 3, verse 1. He writes, And I, brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able to receive it. So, notice first thing, the Spirit through the Apostle, he calls them Brethren. He calls the Corinthian believers brethren. He's not calling them unbelievers. So he points to the evidence of carnality and he likens it to infancy in that they are unable to comprehend bigger and better things about the Lord so that they can move on with their lives, that they can continue to, to grow. So the word carnal in the original language, it means to act fleshly. Fleshly. There is a difference between Fleshy and fleshly. David Gutzig writes it this way. He says, fleshy is simply made of flesh. It can speak of the weakness that is common to every fallen human. Fleshly, when used of a person, means characterized by the flesh. It speaks of the one who who can and should do differently, but does not. So the expectation that is made very clear from the Holy Spirit here is that once a person is born again, they should experience spiritual growth in their life. The minute that you're born again, you, you, you're on a journey now, and you're moving forward. You're constantly moving forward. You're constantly, listen now, growing up. And so the Spirit makes this very clear in in other places of Scripture as well. In Hebrews, the Spirit says through the writer, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil." Spirit says elsewhere through the apostle to the the believers in Ephesus, he says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ. So the expectation to grow is clearly communicated to all of us. Now, another thing that is clearly communicated to us in these passages is that the onus is upon each individual believer to take full responsibility for their own growth in Christ. In other words, it is not someone else's job or responsibility to make sure that you are growing. Hear me out now. It is not your spouse's responsibility to make sure that you're growing. It's not your boyfriend's responsibility. It's not your girlfriend's responsibility. It is not your pastor's responsibility. It is your responsibility to make sure that you are growing. Now, don't get me wrong. It is a father's service to the Lord to teach his children and teach his children he should the word of God. And he will have to answer for his role in doing so. It is a husband's service to the Lord to wash his wife with the water of the word, and so he should, and he will have to answer for that. And it is a pastor's job to feed his flock, and so he should, and every pastor is going to have to answer for the responsibility that God has given them. But hear me out now. These roles were never given to supersede one's responsibility, their own responsibility to care for their own relationship with Jesus. Others can help us grow, but they are not the one primarily responsible for our growth. We are responsible for our own growth. And I know it's hard. You know, I, um, the, I've only been in three churches, I've said before. This is the third church. The first church that I was a part of, was, I was a part of it for about 11, 12 years. And I grew in the church. I was a newborn babe when I got saved uh, at the age of 16, and I was there for a good little while, and I, and I grew. But there are some areas where I didn't grow. And I remember when I went to the second church that I was involved in that I got, I got actually frustrated about the things that I didn't grow in before. And to the point of where I was, I was kind of angry about it, honestly. And, um, and the Lord made it very clear to me, Richard, that was your fault. That falls on my lap, that I did not care for my own growth the way that I should have. I just kind of left it in the hands of, of, of others, and that is not what we are called to do. So when we stand before Jesus and give an account for our life, listen, we are not going to get away with blaming others for our lack of growth or our lack of faith. As Matthew Henry writes, he says, Christians are utterly to blame who do not endeavor to grow in grace and knowledge. Now, directly tied with growing is how and what believers feed themselves. What they feed themselves. Listen to what David Gutzig writes. He says, It wasn't that God prevented them, that is the Corinthian believers, from receiving the solid food that Paul gave. The real problem was the Corinthian attraction to spiritual junk food based on man's wisdom and eloquence. They were so filled with this junk food that they were not able to receive the spiritual food that Paul wanted to give them. Now, we've all grown up, we've had parents, and we've all been told, don't snack before dinner. Why? Because you'll be so full from the, the candy or full from you know, the, the sweet or whatever that you really don't get a chance to eat the more solid things, the things that are uh, better for, for you, right? And so it is true. Now, I cannot tell you, the, the truth of the matter is, is that little children, toddlers, they'll put anything in their mouths, right? Young believers, 
unfortunately, will put anything that they grab hold of in their mouths. Now, I experienced that with my own children when we were growing up, but now I have grandchildren. And, and I want to tell you, I don't think there isn't a single grandchild that hasn't loved a whole mouthful of dog food in, in our house. I mean, you know, we have to, when they come over, we have to put the dog dish in the closet because without question, they'll, someone will get over there and turn around with, I'm talking about a whole mouthful. You would think maybe after one, it'd be like, that's terrible. But no, I mean, it's like, you know, chipmunk cheeks full of, of uh, dog food and you're, you're just, you know, totally grossed out by the whole thing. But listen, spiritual candy, spiritual junk food can give you a sugar rush, but it, in the end, it'll leave you very malnourished, right? Now, oftentimes, uh, difficulty comes in when you have an adult human who is a youngin' in the faith. Why is that a difficulty? Because they think that since they're older in human years, that they don't have much to learn, especially from someone who's younger than them. But I think we all understand that spiritual maturity or immaturity is not necessarily based on human age. Would everybody agree with that? You can have someone who's in their 50s, who is a new believer, a young believer, and then you can have someone who is in their 20s, who received Christ as a young child, grow up under the instruction of the Lord who is a much more mature believer than the 50-year-old. In Christ, the 20-something-year-old is far more mature than the 50-year-old. So it is the humility of the older human, yet younger believer, to receive instruction or correction from the young human, yet mature Believer, Listen, it's the topsy-turvy world, if you will, of the Spirit of God. Think about when, when the church first exploded on the scene. And you had, who's getting saved? Well, we just read in 1 Corinthians, Paul said, not some of you were wise, not some of you were noble, according to the flesh. These were the kinds of people getting saved, were becoming leaders in the church. Who was getting saved? Politicians, religious leaders, and now the people who were slaves and the underclassmen are the ones caring for the souls of the religious leaders and, and the politicians. It's just this crazy thing. So it became the humility of those worldly people then to receive instruction from you know, the believers that God was bringing up. Spiritual maturity is not based on human age and it is certainly not based on worldly status. This was the struggle that a lot of people were having with Timothy. Right, which is why Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy. He said, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Paul would continue to encourage Timothy in his second letter. He wrote this, he said, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of. Here it is, knowing from whom you have learned them and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. It is a mind-blowing thing to speak to, to or even to hear a young person who has grown up in Christ who is on fire for the Lord pray. It is, it is mind-blowing to hear them speak and to teach. You're like, how old is this person, right? It's because the Lord has just anointed them and used them. And, he's in, and the same is for all, it's, it's for all of us to receive that same anointing, to receive that same maturity, that same process as we seek the Lord. Now, I love what Paul says to, um, uh, about Timothy in, uh, to the church in, in Philippi. If you marked Philippians, turn to Philippians chapter, it's actually chapter 2, I don't know if I, I made the correction, but Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 19, Paul writes this, he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged that when I know your state, for I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ, and here it is, but you know his proven character. That's Timothy's proven character. That as a son with his father, he served with me in 
the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. And so Paul, you know, he cherished the, the um, investment of his, his mom, his grandmother, uh, into his life, into Timothy's life. I know I've shared this before as well, but I think it was D.L. Moody who was once asked after a campaign if anyone gotten, had, had got saved at the campaign. And he said, yes, two and a half people. And they said, was that, um, i trying to remember how it went. He said, was that, was that two adults and one child? He said, no, it was two children and, and, and one adult. He said, the two children have their whole life to give to God, where the, the adult has wasted half of his life. Something very similar to that. I think I might have destroyed it. But we must, we must always remember that man looks at the outward appearance, but God sees, right, he, and he, the heart. And he weighs the heart. Carnality is equal to spiritual immaturity, no matter how old we may be in human years. Now, another problem or a sign of carnality or immaturity is thinking selfishly. So look at verse 3 in 1 Corinthians Chapter 3, he says, For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, Oh, I'm of Paul, and another says, oh, I'm of Apollos, are you not carnal? So we're going to pause there for a moment. You've got to let that sink in and think about that. What is he saying here? How does that apply to you? What does that mean? Well, think about what is envy, what is strife, divisions, what is it rooted in? I believe it's rooted in selfishness. The Spirit tells us through the Apostle James that where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires? I'm going to say that is your selfish desires, pleasures, that war in your members, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Or if you ask, you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your, I'm going to say, selfish pleasures. When we envy someone, we clearly are not thinking in a way that is healthy. In fact, this could very well be a progression here that... Envy leads to strife. Strife leads to division. Division leads to suffering. Just teasing. I just had to say that. And oddly enough, the selfishness of the Corinthian believers was over the men that the Lord had brought to minister to them. Now, people don't do that today, do they? Not at all. I prefer this pastor. Well, I prefer that pastor. Well, I prefer so-and-so. Well, unfortunately, we do. And oftentimes, without realizing it, the people of God, by doing such a thing, end up pitting one pastor against another, like it's uh, okay to do, or if it's you know, some sort of a... Almost treating it like a, like a sports... You know, I think sometimes... Pastors are looked upon like the quarterback of spiritual teams, right? They get all the praise when things go well, but then they get all the blame when things don't go well. But listen, last I remember, the last thing a Christian wants to be is a goat. There is no goat in ministry. You remember the song? I don't want to be a goat. Nope. Do you guys know that song? Let me sing it for you. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. Because a goat ain't got no hope. I don't want to be a goat. Nope. I don't want to be a Pharisee. Because a Pharisee is, ain't fair, you see. I don't, you guys never heard that song? Come on. I did children's worship for 12 years. There is no greatest of all time in the ministry when it comes to human beings. It's a carnal way of thinking about the Lord's ministers. I love what one Bible commentator said. He said, so what was the use of fighting which of two nothings was greater? 
and I've said this before, and I think it bears repeating, it is dangerous, it is hurtful for children to have a favorite parent. And it is dangerous and hurtful for a parent to have a favorite child. And so it is with the congregations and their pastors. This kind of thinking, I'm telling you, has led to more church splits than we could imagine. Hear what the Spirit is saying this morning. Thinking this way is carnal. A carnal believer is a Spirit-filled believer acting, thinking selfishly, which leads to envy, to strife, and to divisions. Believers should be purposeful in being productive, not destructive. Instead of spending time indulging our selfish desires, Christians need to spend time discovering the height, the depth, the width, the length of the love of God. That's where we need to concentrate. That's the focus. That's where we need to be spending our time. Lord, who are you? How can I know you more? Lord, show me who you are. Lord, show me your glory. Lord, I just want to see you. I just want to know you. Get our minds off of each other. It's just not healthy. It is not good. Another problem with carnality is it makes us short-sighted. Look at verse 5 in 1 Corinthians uh, 3. He says, Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So stop looking at me. Stop looking at Apollos. Put your eyes on God. So then, he says in verse 7, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God is everything who gives the increase. Giving praise to God's ministers, his servants, rather than to Jesus, could very well indicate short-sightedness, the short-sightedness that carnality produces. Now, I pray, I really pray that the Spirit speaks to you this morning, especially through this, this point here. Listen, some of the Corinthian believers, they could not see beyond their own lifetime. They could not see beyond themselves, and they could not see beyond their own lifetime. That God's plan for their salvation, for the salvation that took place in Corinth, was to go far beyond any of them. Far beyond any of them, far beyond Paul, far beyond Apollos, far beyond, far beyond any disciple or minister or whomever might happen to come through Corinth. God's plan of salvation is to advance throughout the generations as they all submit to the Holy Spirit and as they are all participating and caring for the kingdom of God, for everyone to participate in caring for the kingdom of God, using the gifts that God has freely given us, whether you realize it or not, everyone, is to care for the next generation. For who's coming in after us? Who's coming in behind us? And if people, and when the people of God focus their selfish attention on which person God uses to minister to them, it's to be short-sighted. How many of you are familiar with uh, Corey Ten Boom? Yeah. For those of you who weren't, she was uh, a lady that went through the um, um, camps, the Nazi uh, prison camps, and survived. And, um, you know, the Lord used her tremendously. And uh, she went through tremendous turmoil, but then the Lord used her tremendously afterwards. And she was once asked if it were difficult for her to remain humble. And she responded this way. She said, you know, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey and everyone was waving palm branches and throwing garments on the road and singing praises, do you think that for a moment that it ever entered into the head of the donkey that any of this was for him? She continued, she said, If I can be the donkey on which Jesus Christ rides in his glory, I give him all the praise and all the honor. So Paul's response is, Who am I? 
Who's Paul? I'm a nobody. He's profoundly aware that he is a nobody. He's profoundly aware that Apollos is a... They're, they're nobodies. It is not about us. It is all about God. So, of course, when I think of this, I tell you, and how it applies, I can't help but think of how it applies to us here at Calvary Chapel. And I want you to know, this church belongs to God. This is His. He is the one responsible for this. In fact, I blame Him for it. I, I, I do. Trust me, if it were up to me, I would have stayed where I was. I would have, because you know, want to know why? I think I'm a lot like a lot of you. You're comfortable. You're good. You're safe. There's not a lot of risks going on. Everything was great. Right? I lived, I had, I had everything. You know, I belonged to a thriving church. I had already been through this process, really honestly. And it was painful. And I didn't want to do it again. I had a wonderful home. I had a great position in the church. I was happy. <laughs> Until the Lord made me miserable. And I, and I mean that. I am not trying to be funny or silly. It is the God honest truth. That the idea of the Lord bringing me here is he took it from an idea to being a burden. Where I felt like I knew that I would have been in disobedience to him had I stayed. This church exists solely because of the Spirit of God. Like it or not, <laughs> love it or leave it, this is his doing. It is not mine. Now the Lord, you know, for reasons not known to me, He used me to plant this church. Trust me. I did what any one of you would do. I said, Lord, use somebody else. I don't want to go. It, that's why it took me four years because I just, you know, to come to terms with, okay, I've got to go. But I know that the Lord we'll have to use someone else to water this church. And I pray to God that this church makes it and that it makes it far beyond me and increases more after me than it was under me. I have planted, but the Lord is going to use someone else to water. And listen, we should all have this mindset about the ministries that God has called us to or that He is placing us in, whether it's a C group or you know, a ladies group or a, a children's ministry or a counseling ministry or whatever it is that God has called you to, to think beyond yourself, to think beyond your lifetime in this ministry. It is a healthy way to think. Part of our job is to have God's vision that far exceeds our involvement. There's a couple of things that come from that healthy outlook of thinking beyond ourselves. One is it helps us to realize, listen now, that ministry does not belong to us. Ministry does not belong to you. It doesn't belong to me. It's the Lord's. Now, I want to share this with you, and I share this with you in, 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 in all love. And I, and, and I don't mean this against anyone in particular. It's just my experience over the years. I have, you know, when you become a parent, your perspective changes about life. It, it changes about children. It changes about school. It changes about what you watch on TV. It changes about, you know, all this changes. Listen, when you become a pastor, your perspective changes. The changes, you know, how you look at, at church and how you look at all these things. I have seen people come into church and feel like they have a sense of ownership of, you know, whatever ministry that they belong to. And I understand because that's what the world preaches, that we should, we should you know, um, work as if we own it, like if, like if it's ours. But listen, that's not a biblical concept. The biblical concept is that we, that we are stewards, that it doesn't belong to us. And so what happens is someone will come in and, and start serving, and it and usually happens with youth, for whatever reason. They come in and they start serving, and they get close to the youth, and then something happens. There's usually a, 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 a problem with the leadership that the, that the youth leader doesn't like, and then they leave. 
unfortunately, they still think the youth belongs to them. And so then they're trying to reach out and grab the youth and be a part of the youth's lives. We all operate under the auspices of whatever ministry that God has called us to. Not, on, not under, not under uh, it's not our own. It's, it doesn't belong to us. This church does not belong to me. The moment that God wants to take it from me, it's, it's his to take it. It's his anyway. And, and he can do with it what he wants. You understand that's a healthy mindset to have. So the first thing is that it doesn't belong to us. The second thing is that, that it produces in us, it creates in us a heart of a steward. God knows that we are far more careful to care for something that doesn't belong to us than we do with something that does belong to us. So stewardship has a tendency to produce faithfulness in a way that ownership never can. I'm not saying it doesn't, but it's just differently. For example... If you break something that you own, I mean, you may be just disappointed, but you're not going to be nearly as frightened or concerned as when you break something that you've borrowed or something that doesn't belong to you. If we all had the mindset of a steward, think about how much more careful we would be with our spouses, with our children, with our ministries, with our own lives. All precious things that are only given to us for a short period of time. This is why the Spirit encourages us in many places as He does in 1 Peter when He says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as an owner. Do you see it? Is it on the screen? Does it say as an owner? Does it say own it? as a good steward of the manifold grace of God. The problem with carnality is to be filled with the Spirit, but live like an unbeliever. Think like an unbeliever. To be carnal is to be immature. It is to be selfish. It is to be short-sighted. Let's end with our last scripture of the day. Um, Turn to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, and we'll just close out with this. 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to pick up in verse 5. The Spirit says to the Apostle, But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither... Uh, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I just I pray that the Lord, listen, I bring this up so that you, you see it, that you can read it. My prayer is that you take it home and you meditate on it. And you let the Lord speak to you. There's so much to gain from this. But listen, the purpose is so that you are fruitful. The purpose of the Spirit being in us so that we may know all the things freely given to us by God, so that we may have the mind of God, so that we may be fruitful, so that we may reproduce ourselves. This is the idea. This is the whole point, the whole purpose. Look at verse 9. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. And for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we... Um...